And um, we're going to be we're going to be looking at the New Testament. We're going to get part way in a message, and we'll finish it up next week. Um, is the translation okay? Me wentima. It's okay. Okay, great. Uh, I spoke about this in the Philippines a little bit uh, at the church anniversary with Pastora uh, Francia in Albay, and the Lord brought it to light, it freshened it in a new way in my spirit this week as I was praying and I knew I'd be speaking this Sunday, because part of these verses are the verses that are going to be the theme of the church dedication with Pastora Rowena in two weeks. So in two weeks, I'll be there, Melrose will be there, uh, Ida will be there, Brother Stephen will be there. Panina wanted to be there, but they dare not leave their two young sons in the house by themselves because they're afraid the house wouldn't be there when they got back. <laughs> or maybe their sons wouldn't be there when they got back. I don't know. I don't know. But I believe Cebu Pacific still has seats, so if you want to go with us, you can go. And you can go for a short time. And I know that Pastor Renee is happy to welcome you in June to go to Pastor Susan's to Lo Union as well. Uh, but this is the theme. Th these are the theme verses for Pastor Rowena uh, that as she prayed about it. The Lord brought this to, to her heart. And so that's where we're going to. We're going to begin looking at that this morning and we'll finish talking about it, uh, looking at this next week. The disciples had been with Jesus for about two and a half years when we come to these verses this morning. Jesus began his public ministry when he was about 30 years of age. We don't know exactly when, but almost, almost all Bible scholars say he was about 30, perhaps 31, when he began his public ministry. Until that time, Jesus was unnoticed. Jesus did the work that he had been trained to do as a boy and as a young man under his, fa under his father's work, under his father's tutelage. And then around 30 years or so, he began his public ministry. And very quickly, he gathered the 12 disciples to himself. Why was it so fast? S several of the disciples, many of the disciples, already had open hearts and they were following John the Baptist already. And we remember so well that day. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And Jesus, and we've talked about this, I've preached on this before. Jesus went to him and John said, oh no, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, it is right. This is to fulfill the law. And Jesus was obedient uh, to, to the law. And so he baptized him. And then the very next day, as Jesus was walking along, John had his disciples and John looked at Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Oh, brothers and sisters, what a wonderful, freeing declaration. We sang at the beginning of the service. My chains are gone. I've been set free. Only the Lamb of God can break the chains that bind people. Only the Lamb of God and His blood can clean our sins and make us free and take away the guilt and the condemnation that we have because we could never, ever, ever reach God's holy and righteous standards on our own, no matter how hard we tried, no matter how many churches we would become members of, no matter how many good deeds we would do, no matter how much money we would give, only the Lamb of God can take away the sins of the world. Amen. Amen. And John the Baptist looks at him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And immediately, all oh, those words must have burned like fire in the hearts of his disciples because immediately they turned, they left John, and they followed Jesus. And that was okay with John because John was doing what he had come to do. And he said, I'm a voice. I've come to prepare the way for the one who is coming. And the one who was coming had come. Jesus had come. And so by this time, as we come to these verses that we're going to look at in Matthew 16 in just a minute, they'd been with Jesus for about two and a half years. And they had seen what he had done. They'd seen the miracles. They had seen the incredible things. They had seen Jesus walk on water. They had seen Jesus still the storm with a word. They had seen Jesus take 
just a little bit of bread and some fish, break it and bless thousands of people. They had seen all of these things. They had heard his teaching in the groups and the parables. And they had heard his teaching to them as he had, as he had discipled them and taken them further because their hearts were more open and they were, they were willing to go further. Jesus will take us as far as we're willing to go and as fast as we're willing to go. It depends on us. It depends on our hearts. And so Jesus had brought them along. Two and a half years have passed. And Jesus at that point was very popular. Really popular. I mean, who wouldn't be popular? If Jesus were in your country right now, would he be popular? Sure. Sure. Working miracles. Making blind eyes see. Giving free food. Wow. In a lot of countries, all you have to do is give free food and you can be elected president, right? In the Philippines, Jesus would have been elected president, right? Sure, I, I'm, I'm not making light, I'm, I'm, but I'm trying to make it contemporary so we understand the response. He was so popular. Crowds followed him everywhere. They didn't really want to be his disciples, as, Jesus, as, it, as it's very clear, but they wanted everything that Jesus could give them, and he wanted all the free food. And so they were following him. They were always looking, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? When Jesus was around, it was always exciting. Something was always going to happen. And a lot of people were curious. Honestly, how many of you, if you heard that somebody was going to be healed, a lame man who'd never walked, in Kowloon Park this afternoon, how many of you would go to Kowloon Park this afternoon because you want to see that? Of course, of course. It's human nature, isn't it? So crowds were following Jesus. He's the Messiah. This is what we can get from him. And if he's really the Messiah, then we're going to be free. Israel is going to be great again. Israel's going to be great again. That's what the disciples were thinking as well. If he's the Messiah, then Israel will throw off the yoke of Rome and their rulership. You know, in America right now, I'm so sorry to say there's a politician running for president that keeps on saying, we're going to make America great again. You know, <laughs> you know who I'm talking about, right? And, and his message is very appealing to many people, okay? His message is very appealing. Do you know what? Honestly, and like I said, I want, I want to make this contemporary for us this morning. That's how a lot of people were looking at Jesus, really. And in fact, I think that's how, not I think, it's very clear, that is in part how the disciples were looking at Jesus. They really were. He's going to make Israel great again. Really, that's what they were thinking. We're, we're, and we're his best friends. We're the inner circle. And so we're going to be right up there with Jesus, right? We're, we're going to be the deputies and the ministers and the whatever, the deputy prime ministers and whatever um, of Israel. Surely they were thinking that. It's very clear from everything that we read. So all of this is going on publicly. Great popularity for Jesus on one side. On the other side, Official opposition was growing greater and greater and greater. The re religious leaders didn't like Jesus because he really talked about holiness. And all of the religious things that they did, Jesus said, your righteousness is as filthy rags. This is what God wants. God wants sincere hearts. God wants all of this. So they didn't like that. And then those who had political power who were Jewish, they didn't like him either because they thought, if this man becomes king, if he's really the Messiah, it's going to upset our positions of power and influence. So in the, in the general public, great popularity growing and officially great opposition ride, rising. So this is what's going on. And in the middle of it, what does Jesus do at this point? What does Jesus do? If Jesus were any old king or any earthly king, he would have overthrown the Roman government. He would have gathered more people to him to become more and more popular so that there could be a popular uprising. Really. And that's what Rome feared. That's not what Rome... Rome didn't want that. But Jesus was not an earthly king. And so in the middle of this great popularity and this rising opposition, Jesus takes his disciples and he leaves Jerusalem. He leaves the populated areas. He leaves the Jewish areas. And when we come to these verses this morning, we read in Matthew 16, in these verses, we see that Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. And so Jesus brings his disciples into this <coughs> region. Where was Caesarea Philippi? 
Caesarea Philippi was at the very far north. I didn't bring any maps this morning, but you can look in your Bibles. He'll, he'll get it in just a minute. Here we go. Verse 13, he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he brings his disciples with him. Now for us to understand all that's going on here, we need to know a little bit more about this city. It wasn't always called this. It was, a, it was called by another name before this time, but it wasn't a Jewish area. It was a Greek and a Roman area. Very few Jews were in this area. There was very little Jewish religious influence at all. And in fact, this area, Caesarea Philippi, was a pretty pagan area. In times past, in the early years, it had been a huge center of worship uh, of Baal, of, of the, of the uh, pagan god, of the Canaanite god Baal, a great worship center for Baal. And then as time passed, when the Greeks were in power, it had become a city named after the Greek god Pan, uh, the one that you see, he uh, has the feet of goats and he plays a pipe and whatever, uh, the god of, uh, of certain types of music and things and festivities and things like that. And he was the Greek, uh, the Greek god Pan. And so there were all of these shrines to Pan and it was an area of all sorts of ungodly worship. And then when the Romans came in, the Romans, uh, the le Roman leaders had built a temple to Caesar Augustus and there they worshiped Caesar Augustus. So this was a godless area. There, 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 the, the temple was far away, the temple to God was far away. This was a godless, this was not a Jewish area. Jesus brings his disciples away from all of that, comes into this area, and here he asks his disciples some questions. And the questions are what we're going to talk about this morning. So, the first question he asked them was this, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Son of Man is a term that's used in the Old Testament and Jesus took that term because it shows his humanity, the part, the human part of him, but it also shows that he is divine together, those two together. And so he often called himself the Son of Man and everybody understood that. And so he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Or who do people say that I am? And I want you to think, as I told you at the beginning, I want it to be contemporary today as we're looking at this. What type of question is this? Is it a question about how popular am I? What do people think about me? Do people like me? And so on. We ask questions like this all the time, don't we? We dress up in the morning, as I used the example in the first service. We dress up and wives, maybe we, I don't know if husbands do it to wives. Do husbands do it to wives? Husbands get dressed and they, they go to their wife and they turn around and they say, how do I look? Does this make me look? big or does it make me look or whatever um, or wives dress up and they they say how do I look now you know that if somebody asks you that they don't really want usually they don't really want a completely honest answer right <laughs> when we ask that question when people ask that question it's usually a question for reassurance isn't it I, I, do I look good, right? That's, that's honest, honest, and that's human nature. That's human nature. How do I look? Oh, you look really good. You look really whatever. That is a, it's a question ask, asking for affirmation and for confirmation. You look, you look good. I was thinking about this as well last night. It's something that's a little bit, that's happening in the U.S. right now with all of the political, uh, with all of the political things going on in the U.S. right now. All of the candidates have focus groups and they bring together a group of people and the questioner says, now what do you think about the candidate? Now what about this? Now when he says this, do you like that or you don't like that? They ask all sorts of questions and they get all the feedback they can and then they make the candidate a certain way so that he will appeal. So that he will appeal. Is that what Jesus is doing here? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Jesus had no need for affirmation. Jesus had no need to be, said, to be patted on the shoulder and say, hey, Jesus, people really like you. They really, they really like you a lot, especially when you give them bread and food. They really like you a lot. <laughs> and, and I'm not trying to make fun of Jesus. I'm really not. You understand that of the situation. But it helps us to understand what's going on here. Jesus was not 
asking that. He was coming to a very specific point. What is their answer? Because he knew who he was. He knew, I am sent from God. Do you know what, brothers and sisters? When you know who you are in Christ, and you're not trying to get your image from the world, when you're not trying to find out, well, do people like me or they don't like me? And pastors face this too. We, pastors, we, we struggle with this as well. But we have to get our identity, all of us. We have to get who we are in Christ, what God has made of me. This is who I am in Christ. And when you do, it releases you from the bondage and the fear of what do people think about me? Do they like me? Do they not? Am I popular? Am I not? Find out who you are in Christ and then go. Go forward. Jesus knew who he was and he knew why he had come. What is the answer of the disciples? Look at the answer. Do they say, who do they say? They say, well, they replied. Some say John the Baptist. Was John the Baptist a good person? Yes. Was he a true prophet of God? Yes. yes. Some say Elijah. Was Elijah a true prophet? Yes. Most of the Jews considered Elijah to be the greatest Old Testament prophet. That's why it talks about, that's why John the Baptist was considered Elijah in the New Testament, preparing the way, and that Elijah will yet come again. And others say Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a greatly admired prophet as well, and, or one of the other prophets. Now I want you to look at something with me this morning. Were any of these people bad people? No. They were all good people. Only one problem. None of these answers came to the point that he was God and the Son of God. Have you found that to be true ar around other people? Do you know that most people in the world are very willing to say good things about Jesus? Have you found that? Yes. He was a very good teacher, wasn't he? Oh, he was a great man. Oh, he showed greater love than anybody else. Oh, he was the greatest man that ever lived. They will say even Skeptics, even agnostics and even atheists will say very good things about Jesus. But that's not enough, is it? Because Jesus is not part of a religious buffet. He's not. He's not part of a religious buffet. He's not one of the... Even Muslims say, oh, he was a very great teacher. But that's not enough. Because Jesus was more than that. If the only way people think of Jesus, he was a very great teacher, then they miss why he came. They miss why he came. And so, I think about this sometime. I don't know, do you ever watch television when they interview or they show spiritual people? Do you ever? I do sometimes and I look at it and I just shake my head. Especially when the, if I'm watching, I see it on American television a little bit more and it really makes me sad uh, when they program, when I watch, uh, in, uh, uh, anyhow, TV programs from the States or news programs from the, the States. You know what they often say? I don't know about your country, but this is what they say. It's very common among Americans. They will say, I'm a very spiritual person. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? Oh my goodness, maybe they say that in Canada as well. I'm a very spiritual person. Do you know what? When I hear somebody say that, almost always, in fact, pretty much 100% of the time, the person doesn't know Jesus. The person is not born again. But I'm a very spiritual person. That means, ooh, you know? <laughs> I, and and, and it's, it's really, it's true. And if you look at their rooms or their homes, if they're interviewing them, in the background, there will be a picture of, a, a picture of Jesus maybe or a statue. And oh, and who else, Pastor Renee? Buddha. Oh, Buddha will always be there. Ah, oh, that's right. Some sort of Zen something. A yin and a yang. All of those things. Maybe there'll be a Hindu god. Often there's a Hindu god on the side. A picture of Mary. All of this. And it'll all be in the background. It's all part of spirituality. And Jesus is part of it. it it's true, isn't it? Seriously. When, pe when people are like that. The only problem is, that's not good enough. Jesus is not part of, oh, they're all good and they're all that. Because that's what, the, that's what the Israelites were willing to say. Oh, he's this, he's this, he's this, he's this. 
But if Jesus is anything less than the Son of God, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, then he is not to that person, he cannot be to them what he came to be. He cannot save their sin. He cannot save them from their sins or take them to heaven because they don't see him as that. Jesus said about what did he say about himself? Jesus said, "I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life." Do you want a statement that will offend a lot of people, a lot of good people, a lot of spiritual people, a lot of people who say, "Well, I'm being as as good as I can, and I want to know the way to God." All you have to do is say, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And you've turned off a whole bunch of people right then because it's exclusive. There's no other way. There's no other truth. There's no other life except what is found in Jesus. And that's what he said about himself. And until people can come to that, they will not be able to come to God. They can't come to God. But this will, this will, you will find... This will close the door on so many people. They will say, well, I can't take that. No, 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 no. He's one of the ways. He's one of the ways. And when somebody says, well, he's one of the ways, he's saying the same thing as, well, he's maybe Elijah, maybe Jeremiah, uh, maybe John the Baptist. He's not God until he is only God, the way and the truth and the life. And that's what Jesus said about himself. But Jesus doesn't leave it there. And then he asks, because he asks another question. And this is what he was getting to. And what do we see? He says, he asked them, but who, and let's leave it right there for just a minute, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say? And I want us to think about that for just a minute. Because I meet so many people, and I meet Christians who don't want to deal with, with this question, who don't want to interact with God at that level. So many Christians, and so many others as well, want to be theoretical, right? Let's talk about God. Let's have a discussion about God. Let's talk about things. What about this and what? What do people say that God is? And you will find many people who, even Christians, who are happy to talk about religious things and the Bible, this and that, but never get to this level. And brothers and sisters, what I have found about Jesus is this. Jesus doesn't spend a lot of time with theoretical discussions. He doesn't. Jesus makes it personal. Jesus makes it personal. Jesus says to you, and Jesus says to me, who do you say that I am? Not what others. Who do you say? Jesus wants to interact with us personally, one-on-one. -on -one. He makes it real. He makes it real. Do you remember what Jesus said, this is, uh, uh, it's after this. Remember when Lazarus dies? You know, and we've talked about this before. Lazarus is dead. Jesus and his disciples, and this, this illustrates this point. Jesus and his disciples go into the village. Mary and Martha are crying. And Martha comes running out because she was a woman of action. And Martha says, Jesus, if you had come, in fact, let me just, let me just look at it. She says, Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And that we always think that too. Jesus, don't we blame, we sort of accuse God, don't we, sometimes? You could have done it, and you didn't. Jesus, you could have healed me, and you didn't. I didn't have to have this sickness or that. You could have made that happen, and he didn't. And Martha says, Jesus, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And there's a level of truth there, isn't there? Martha, Martha saw in Jesus, he was God. She saw the miraculous in Jesus. But as I was thinking about this, this morning, in fact, and, and, and as I went back to read it. And Jesus, you know what he answers to her? Listen, this is in, in John, uh, I don't have it up here, but it's in John 11, and you can look on your own. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. Do you know what Martha replies? Yes. She doesn't say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Lazarus is going to be raised from the dead. She, what does she say? It's so hard to believe, isn't it? What does she say? Yes, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. <laughs> now, was that true? Yes. 
Was her doctrine correct? Her doctrine was correct. There was only one problem. Her faith and her belief didn't match her doctrine. And brothers and sisters, I think that's where we are so often. We've got it all up here. Yes, the, the Word of God says this. And Jesus comes into our lives and He smashes our hearts at times when we face impossible situations. Right, Julie? Right. When we say, but oh God, and we pray and we look for an answer and the answer that we wanted and the way we wanted, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And Jesus, does the enemy bring ill? Yes, he does. But God is still at work. And Jesus comes into those situations that are so hard that it, it messes up. Our doctrine gets messed up, right? And it shows where we believe and it shows where we trust. And it shows where we don't believe and where we don't trust God. Yes, I know th this is, I know the Bible says this. And Jesus comes into our lives, into our hearts, into our impossible situations. And he says, but what do you believe about me in this situation? In effect, Jesus says in these impossible situations that you and I face when we don't understand, when healing doesn't come, when the door doesn't open, when the finances aren't there, and in effect, Jesus is saying, yes, I know that the Bible says my God shall supply all your needs. I know that the Bible says he that trusts in the Lord shall lack for no good thing. I know all of these things. And Jesus comes into our lives and into our situations in that moment. And he says, but what do you believe about this? What do you, do you still love me? Do you believe that I'm a good God? Do you believe that I have a good plan for your life? Even if you're not healed. Even if the door doesn't open, even if the job doesn't come, do you still believe? Will you still follow me? That's what Jesus does every day. That's what Jesus wants to do, is trying to do in your life and in my life. That's what Jesus is doing. He makes it personal in our lives. And so Jesus says to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? I don't care what the whole world says about me. The crowds followed for free food and a kingdom. The leaders opposed because they wanted to keep the status quo. But Jesus says to those who claim, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, my life is yours. Jesus, I follow you. Jesus still says today, what do you think about me? What do you believe about me, really? And how, what is your life like in relationship? I, I think that's the heart of this question. I really do. I think that's the base. That's the base of this question. And that's why, as I said, I, I want it, it, it needs to be contemporary. It needs to be immediate for you and for me. And I have found in my life, I don't know about yours, but I think I'm pretty n normal. I think I'm pretty much like you, that when everything goes along smoothly, no problems, and I'm just going from day to day, I don't have to face these questions very much. But when difficulties come, and when answers don't come, and when things don't work out the way that I thought, that I wanted them to, and that I prayed for, and that I believed for, you know, and that I claimed for, the Word of God this, that that is when Jesus comes to my heart and says, Jennifer, do you still believe I'm God? Do you still trust me with your life? Do you still believe I'm a God of love and that I care about you and that I will take care of you? And that's when I have to answer those questions, truly, truly, rather than theoretically. Who do you say that I am? What we truly believe about Jesus matters, matters. Well, we're talking about the disciples, so you know who's going to answer. Who's going to answer? Of course Peter's going to answer. Let's see what comes next. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, A plus for Simon Peter at this point. <laughs> Because Simon Peter so often put his foot in his mouth, 
Simon Peter so often said the wrong thing. Simon Peter so often jumped in when he shouldn't have. Simon Peter so often blah, 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 blah. In fact, a little bit later on, you know, when Simon Peter on the mountain of transfiguration, when Simon Peter gets carried away, he says, oh, let's build three temp let's th build three tabernacles. Do you know what God says to Peter? It's the voice of God. That's right. Really, what God says to Peter at that point is, shut up. <laughs> you read it for yourself. He's, he says, this is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. So Simon Peter usually, he often gets it wrong. But here is one time Simon Peter, amen, he got it right, didn't he? <laughs> he got it right. He says the right thing. He gives the correct answer, and he says, you are the Messiah. Now, we know this, this verse well. What does Messiah mean? It means Christ, or what? Savior, it means the, the anointed one, right? The anointed one. And it would, have, it would have been something they all would have understood. It would have, they would have understood this is the one sent from God. Anointing means commissioned to do a work and equipped with power to do that work. Very specific. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He gets it right. He gets it right. He sees and he speaks the full truth. Now, how did Simon Peter come to that answer? And that's what we're going to talk about in the, in the little bit of time that remains, and then we're going to pick it up next week. How does Simon Peter come to that? Is it by process of deduction? If you walk on the water, if you heal blind eyes, if you miraculously create bread for 5,000 and then 4,000 out of a very small amount, if you speak the word and the storm is stilled, if you can even help me, because remember, Peter walked on the water just a little bit, didn't he? Just a little bit. If you can help even me walk on the water, then one plus one plus one plus one plus one, plus one equals five. You must be the Messiah. Is that how Peter comes to this truth? And it's true. Is that how it happens? No. What does Jesus say? Let's look at verse 17. Jesus replied, you are blessed. Now, not you are blessed. Not like that. But in other words, you receive, it's, it's a blessing, it's a grace, it's something that God has given, which is always true whenever God gives us insight and understanding. But look at what Jesus says. You're blessed because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Or NIV in King James says, flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. That's, those are the other translations. And so Jesus immediately says, this came from God. This is a revelation from God. Brothers and sisters, this is the only way you and I will ever understand spiritual things. It's the only way. It's the only way. The Bible makes this very, very clear. Very, very clear. I, I told the story in the first service. It says, you did not learn this from any human being. It came from heaven. It was a, a revelation. It's, a, it's the word revealed. It's not just, oh, now you understand. It's a, it's a, it's a supernatural revelation opening of heaven, if you will, and then truth coming in. How many of you, you've experienced that before? I trust all of us have. If you are a child of God this morning, you have received revelation. You're not just going to follow Jesus because he's good. At some point in your life, you came to the point where you realized Jesus is God. He has taken my, he, he offers to take away my sins. He will change my life. And without him, I am hopeless and lost. There is no hope for me in this world apart from Jesus. And that was revelation. That was revelation to you because God loves you. And the Bible says he doesn't want anybody to perish, but everybody to come to repentance, to come to know him. So if you are a child of God this morning, it's because at some point you received revelation. Now you may not have seen a light shine. Some people did. You may not have a, <gasps> but it's still revelation from God. Because you know, in fact, when Simon Peter says this, there's no indication that he even feels it's a revelation of God. He just says it. But it is the revelation of God. I was thinking about this yesterday as I was preparing, and this reminded me of something that happened many years ago when I was teaching in Peking University, in Beijing University, uh, with Betty in 1986. 
87, 88, anyhow, a long time ago, in the 80s, in the mid 80s. The first year that we taught there, we taught the professors of the university. Now, Beijing University or Peking University is almost, some would say, the top university in China. So it's the top of the top of the top, the smartest of the smartest of the smartest. And so you can imagine the level of the professors who were at that university. And there was this one lady who was in the mathematics department. She was a mathematician. <laughs> Amazing. Um, the, my grasp of numbers and mathematics and things like that is poor at best. It's poor at best. But this lady was in the mathematics department at the top university in China. And she became friends with us. And she was, she was really interested. She, she wanted to be friends with us, and we became friends. She was a really nice lady. And she soon became interested in Christianity. And she would ask us questions. She would ask us about Jesus, and we would explain. And she would ask us about faith, and we would explain. And she would ask us about, what, what do you mean, how can you be a Christian? We talk about God living inside and whatever. And she just could not get it. She could not get it. She was trying to understand by human methods, by flesh and blood. And she was so smart, so smart. And she, she could figure out, you name, she could figure it out. And for her, two plus two equals what? Four. Has to equal four. That's right. Thank you. You could be a mathematician. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I keep it with the easy numbers for the rest of us, right? <laughs> two plus two equals four. She could figure that out. But for her, two plus two had to equal four. That's how the analytical mind would understand it. That's how a mathematician would come to understand something like this. It has to make sense. I have to be able to figure it out. I have to know the answer. I've got to see the steps. And then I'll believe. Then, not even I'll believe, then I'll accept. Maybe to say it that way. Yeah, not even as much believe. I'll accept. You know, at best. And for two years, brothers and sisters, she asked the same questions over and over and over. Guess what? We gave her the same answers <laughs> over and over and over. And we talked with her about faith. She couldn't get that. We mean faith. She couldn't get it. Why? She wanted to understand with her brain. Now God gives us our brains. There's nothing wrong with that. God gives us our brains. But our brains alone cannot apprehend, cannot figure out God. He's a whole lot bigger. He's a whole lot bigger. He made it. He made it. So don't start getting the idea, well, I've got a lot of questions. I don't know if God can answer them or not. God could answer every question if he, wa if he wanted to. He could. He could answer every single question. The problem is, some people, when they're asking questions, they don't really want to have the question answered so that they can know God. They just want to ask questions. But what about this? What about this? And rather, being a, than, rather than being a way to God, for some people, questions are a wall that keeps them from God. But this lady was sincere. She kept on asking questions. And we would tell her, but it still didn't make sense. In effect, how can 2 plus 2 equal 5? That, that's what it was. She couldn't get it. Two years passed. And so we were really praying. We were so tired of talking to her. We really were. We really were. We just thought, oh, because it was the same questions over and over. And she'd ask again and again. We'd give the same answers. And so we really started praying. Why? Because flesh and blood won't get it. Our best answers wouldn't convince her. It was going to have to take, it was going to take something more than our best minds because our minds weren't as, as clever as her minds. We didn't know as much as she knew, but we knew God. So we started praying. We really started praying. And one afternoon, she was sitting in our living room. She looked at us, and she asked the same questions again. We answered the questions. And then Betty just looked at me, and she went, and, and she rolled her eyes. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I said, yeah, I, we were tired of it. And suddenly, we heard her say, as she looked at us, I want the Spirit of God in my life. Just like that. I want the Spirit of God. Only God can do that. Who do you say that I am? Were all of her questions answered? No, 
they weren't. But enough had been answered, and God began to reveal, reveal himself to her so that she knew he is real. He's real. There's something there. I don't, I don't know it all. I don't understand it all, but I want it. I want it. And the desire was enough, and the small glimpse was enough to get her across the hurdle of having to know everything and having all of her questions answered. We said, okay, and at that moment we prayed. We prayed. And I didn't tell this in the first service, and I know it's time to stop, but, and then we're, gonna, we're all going to pray in just a minute. But let me tell you what happened when we prayed. She, of course, accepted the Lord right then. But you know what? I'll be really honest with you. Betty and I were so tired, we didn't feel anything spiritually. We really didn't, because we were so tired. And we'd been talking with her for two or, two or three hours that afternoon. We had no special feeling as we prayed for her. Do you know what happened after we prayed? And it was a very simple prayer of accepting Jesus, and she did. After we finished praying, she opened her eyes and she looked at us, and she said, Did you feel that? And we looked at her, we said, <laughs> we didn't feel a thing. We, 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 didn't, we didn't feel anything. In fact, our hearts didn't have any special, oh Lord, finally, because we were so tired. She said, you didn't feel that? And we said, no, what was it? And she said, it was like electricity from the top of my head all the way through my body down to my feet. Now, don't make a doctrine out of that. When somebody becomes a Christian, they may or may not feel anything, but God did something supernatural for her that went beyond her mind, and it was the revelation of God. So, brothers and sisters, we come to a close, and thank you. We're going to finish this up next week. But what I want to say to you is this. First of all, this morning, if you are here and you have questions about God, I want to challenge you. You're not yet a Christian, but I want to challenge you. Are your questions sincerely a way to come to God? Or are your questions a wall? You want to know this, 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 and this. You're not really interested in knowing God. It makes a difference. And then secondly, for those of you who are children of God already this morning, what do you do personally? Are you at the place where Jesus is saying, in effect, what do you believe about me? What do you believe about me? And you may, may be at a place this morning where you are really struggling. There are some things in your life that you can't answer, that aren't explained, that you don't like, that you've prayed for, that haven't changed. And you've been trying to make it work. You've been trying to figure it out. If you will let him, he will help you come to the place this morning where you can say, God, I don't understand and I can't figure it out, but I trust you. You are the Messiah. You are the one sent from God. I believe you. I believe you. And if you are willing to take that step as a Christian this morning, he will bring you. He'll get you over that bridge. He'll get you over that hurdle. He'll get you over that hard spot where you feel like, I just can't get beyond this. So we're going to pray right now, okay? The Messiah is here this morning. The Holy Spirit is here. And he's going to talk to you. If you're sincere this morning and you will talk to him, he's going to talk to your heart right now, okay? So I'm going to pray for you, but you've got to pray, because God doesn't want to hear me. God and I are okay right now. I've already, I'm, I'm prayed up. I've been talking with him. God wants to hear you this morning. So as I pray, would you pray also? And if, the, if a friend is with you this morning, and, and they are facing things, you can pray with them as we pray. We're just, we're just going to come to God this morning. He's really real. He's, he's just like Jesus with the disciples. He doesn't care what other people think about him. He cares what you think about him. He cares where you are this morning. Jesus, we come to you right now. We see ourselves just as those disciples gathered around you, um, talking about what people thought about you. But Jesus, what you care about is where we are in our relationship with you this morning. That's what you care about. And so, Lord, this morning, Lord, this morning, we come to you where we are. We want to be honest because you already know where we are. God, some of us have cold, hard hearts this morning, and we're your children. We belong to you. We were, we're Christians, and yet our hearts are so cold and hard. We are so far from you. We haven't felt you in months. 
we've been doing our own thing and we just haven't felt you at all. We're so far, we feel like we're so far away from you and we don't want to be there. Lord, others of us this morning are struggling with answers that we, questions that we cannot answer and we've been trying. We've been a little bit angry with you and we've been frustrated. God, why haven't you? Why couldn't you? Why didn't you? And Lord, instead we want to come to you and just lay all of those things at your feet this morning. We do. We just lay them at your feet. Oh, Jesus, help us. Help us this morning. Help us. Jesus, I want to have a fresh relationship with you. Jesus, I want to be walking closely with you. Jesus, I want to know the joy of your life in my life again. I want to feel your fresh touch upon me and to know that you're with me and to hear your voice speaking to me. Oh, help me. Help me because I can't get there myself. My flesh and blood has tried and it hasn't gotten me where I wanted to go. But you can reveal yourself to me. You can. You can. Would you reveal yourself? Would you reveal yourself this morning in my life, in my heart, in my situation? I give you my cold, hard heart. Would you make it soft? Would you make it fresh and new again? Would you lead me in your ways? Would you walk beside me again? May I know that you're walking beside me and I welcome you to walk beside me and lead me in your path along your ways. I can't do it by myself. I can't do it anymore and I've been trying. But you can, beyond the natural, beyond my human effort, you can. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus, for being here with us today, for listening for not rejecting us and pushing us away because we haven't been very good Christians, but for being right here and not letting us go, but staying with us and saying, who do you say that I am? Because you want to be in relationship with us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.